When I was a kid, one of the joys of my entire year was that part of the year when I got to pick what shoes I would buy or my parents would buy for the basketball season. And I remember when I was a seventh grader, I didn't really care what brand I got, but what I really wanted in my basketball shoes were that they were the color of black. Everyone had white basketball shoes at the time, and I wanted to be different. I, I wanted black. The problem was that black basketball shoes were very hard to find. And so we went to all of the sports stores in the area. Remember, no internet at the time. So we checked out Foot Locker and Champs, and there was a store, maybe some of you remember, called the Athlete's Foot. Anyway, and none of them had even one option for black basketball shoes. Finally, we found one pair in, well, you'd guess it probably, in the Sears catalog. <laughs> they were this off-brand, I think they were called USA, Olymp uh, USA Olympic basketball shoes, and that is what I wore for seventh grade basketball. Now, I want you to contrast the limited options for basketball shoes in the early 90s to basketball shoes today. <laughs> if, you'd, if you'd go to the Nike website, you'd find that just even in just that one brand, there are hundreds of different styles, hundreds of different colors that you can order. And if you've never been on that website, here's something you probably didn't know. For some of the more popular basketball shoes, you can actually customize them to make them exactly the way you want them. So like, this is how it works. If you want a red swoosh on your left shoe and a black swoosh on your right, you can make that happen. You can order it that way. If you want the tongue of the shoe to be green and the shoelaces to be yellow and the sole to be purple, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if you wanted that, you could order it that way. If you wanted your jersey number embroidered on the back of the shoe, you can do that on the Nike website. It's actually pretty cool. It's also pretty indicative of life in the 21st century. We have options all around us. There's options for everything. And the reality is this. We're used to having things exactly the way we want them. And when it comes to basketball shoes, Nothing wrong with that. When it comes to the literally thousand different options you have when you go to Caribou or Starbucks with all the different shots and sizes and you know, all that, like there's nothing wrong with that. When it comes to your Whopper and getting it your way right away, nothing wrong with that. But when it comes to having things the way I want them, well, we can tend to run into issues with that. Here's how. When people view God like they view the shoe customizer on Nike. This is how this goes. And we all have a little bit of this in us. I'm going to believe what I want to believe. And I'm going to take a little bit of this. And I'm going to take a little bit of that. And I'm going to accept these things about my view of God and faith because, well, I like those things. And these other things that are either difficult or go against the way that I personally feel, I'm going to leave those and aside. And, and in our culture, there's this feeling, there's this idea that all roads essentially lead to God. And as long as I believe in God and am not a horrible person... I'll be okay. <laughs> and if you would dare speak up and say otherwise, that isn't the way that it works. Well, you are hurtful, hateful, and intolerant. The question we have before us today is this one. Are Christians intolerant? It's one of the most difficult questions in this series to answer in a 30 to 35 minute monologue called a sermon. 
But it is so, so important for us to think about, to address, and to unpack. Now, one of the things I want to acknowledge at the very beginning of this, because I want you to see my heart and how I feel, is that this, the idea that all roads lead to God is an appealing idea. What I mean by that is this, I'd like that to be true. I hope you feel that way too. Shame on any of us if we don't want everyone to be in heaven someday, to be with the Lord. That's, that's what we want. And to be honest, God wants it too. There's this famous passage, maybe you remember it. God wants all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. But just because it's an appealing idea that all roads lead to God does not mean that it's true. Just because we want it to be true doesn't mean that it is true. And way more important than what I think about this answer is what God says and what he thinks about the answer to the question of what road or roads lead to God. At the very end of Jesus' earthly life, it was the, the night before he died. Um, most of you know this. He had his disciples together. He was sharing with them a lot of very important stuff. We reference this night a lot in um, our sermons because there's so much scripture about it. But one of the things he told the disciples was, I'm not going to be with you for very long. And then one of the disciples replied, Thomas it was, said, um, Lord, um, can you tell us how to go where you are going? Can, can you tell us how to get to the Father just like you are going to the Father? And here's what Jesus said. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, nobody, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, when you hear these words, you may be a person who doesn't like them. And I suppose in, in many ways, this, what seems to be the exclusive nature of what Jesus said, uh, if you have certain feelings that make you uncomfortable with this, you know, in many ways, that's up to you. That, those are your feelings, okay? But when it comes to what the Bible says, when it comes to what Jesus claimed, what we can't deny, there is no shadow of a doubt that Jesus is clear that not all roads lead to the Father. In fact, this leads us to our first fill-in for today. Um, we are a fill-in-the-notes type of church, so if you've got your sermon notes, you can go ahead and fill in if you'd like. That the only way to have a relationship with God is through Jesus. The only way to get to heaven is through faith in Jesus. The only way to have your sins forgiven is by trusting in the one who died for our sins, Jesus. The only way to be considered a child of God and to receive the benefits, the inheritance that children receive from their heavenly father is through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And 2,000 years ago, when Jesus spoke these words, they were politically incorrect because they lived in an empire where there were a multitude of Roman gods. And in fact, for the first few hundred years of Christianity, it was illegal in the Roman Empire. Fast forward 2,000 years, some things have changed, but some things have not. To say this is also still today politically incorrect. And I guess we have a choice. We could pretend like it's not true, pretend that all roads lead to God and to heaven. And in the short term, guess what? If we were to pretend, you'd be considered, uh, you know, very inclusive, and you'd be considered as someone who, is, uh, uh, who listens well and all of those things. But 
at the end of the day, in the long term, we would not be helping people. Because the truth is, just because something sounds good doesn't mean that it's true. A few months ago, I was watching a documentary. It was called um, The Rescue. Um, Maybe some of you have seen this uh, as well. It's a documentary about that uh, Thai boys soccer team that got trapped in a cave back in 2018. Some of you I know watched and followed along on the news as there was a lot of media coverage around whether they were going to be rescued or not. So you see, what happened was that this uh, soccer team, 12 boys and their coach, they had gone exploring in a cave, and they were deep inside the cave, and the rainwaters rose a lot quicker than what they expected or than they usually do. And so what happened was, you see a little bit of a depiction of it here, but that the waters rose and the team was trapped in an area where they could not get out. In fact, even after authorities had figured out where the team was, because of how long of a route it was to get there through the water, they didn't know how to get them out. They didn't know how to rescue them. So if you watch the documentary, what happened was there was this um, cave diving team. They would swim in uh, water in caves that was from the UK, and they brought them in to kind of help them problem solve a rescue plan. And it was very, very hard, but here's the rescue plan that they came up with. They would give each of the boys a shot that would make them unconscious, then they would put a, uh, basically a scuba mask over the boys' heads to keep the water out, right? Then while they're unconscious, they would strap the boys to their body, and as they're pulling on a rope, because they can't see anything in the dark water, God willing, through that big, long journey, save them without the mask leaking and the boys drowning. Very, very dangerous. Some of you know how this ended. Praise God, all 12 boys and the coach were all rescued, and the rescue plan worked. Now, I want to set up quickly a little bit of a make-believe scenario. What if when the diver got to the boys, one of the boys said, I don't like that plan. I don't want a mask on my face, and I don't want you to give me a shot. Here's what I believe. I believe that if I hold my breath really well and swim really fast, I can make it out. And what if the diver responded, hmm, I hear what you're saying, and I want this, <laughs> I want this to be a safe place where all opinions are regarded as being truth. So if that's your truth, young man, well then, do it. That's your rescue plan. Just because something sounds good doesn't mean it's true. And you know what negligence would be? Negligence would be that diver allowing that boy to try a rescue plan that he knew didn't work. Love would listen and respond with the only truth. And man, I know you don't like the plan, but this is the only way. When it comes to God's rescue plan, do you know what the world needs more than anything? It needs people who are brave enough and loving enough to share truth. To share truth, the the truth, most importantly, that Jesus is the only way. Because as much as we would like to say all roads lead to God, the reality is they don't. Jesus, 
and his sacrifice on the cross and what he did for sinners like you and me, that is the only way to have a relationship with God. You know what this world needs? It needs people who are willing to stand up for truth. And part of that truth being the standard, that there is a standard of right and wrong. And I know sometimes that it's countercultural to say some things are right and some things are wrong. And I know it's a difficult thing to navigate. And I know, Christians, that sometimes even we feel like we're not sure exactly what God intended with some things. But there is truth that God has given to us. And whether we always love it or not, here's what I do know, that God knows what is very best for us. And he has given us that truth in his word. We need people who are willing to stand up and in love, share truth in a world that would like to customize and optimize their own take on God and faith. Now, are Christians intolerant? Well, it's an interesting thing that has happened over the last 25 years. It has to do with definitions of terms. So take the word moment, tolerant. Do you know what tolerant actually means? Well, you can Google it. Any dictionary will give you a definition that's very similar to this. It is the willingness to allow the existence of opinions or behavior that one does not necessarily agree with. So here's what culture doesn't get because we've changed definitions that you can be tolerant of something and yet not necessarily agree with it. What we have been programmed to think is that the only way that you're tolerant is if you accept as truth what other people believe. Do you see the difference there? Here's what Tim Keller, a pastor that I follow, um, said, thought it was helpful. Tolerance isn't about not having beliefs. Like everything is true, and that's the only way you are tolerant. It's about how your beliefs lead you to treat people who disagree with you. It's interesting, isn't it? And I'm not saying that Christians have done a great job at that either, <laughs> but it's important for us to define terms. Leads us to our second fill-in for today. Tolerance is not avoiding disagreement with people. It's how you treat the people you disagree with. So for the rest of the time that we have together, I want to quickly talk about the answer to this question. How do we disagree well? There are things about God and the Bible and about truth that are not up for interpretation, that are specific and black and white. And we can't back down from those as Christians. So how do we disagree well? Well, Peter, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and one of the leaders of the early Christian church. Um, He wrote some letters that are found um, in the Bible. Um, They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And one of the things he wrote about was how Christians back in the first century would interact and act at a time and in a culture where many, many people disagreed with them. I want to look at three verses that he writes and how to disagree well. 1 Peter 3, verse 13. Who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? And I want to pause there because I think our mindset and our attitude is what Paul directs first. Do you remember, because we talk about it here quite a bit, do you remember the uh, overarching characteristic that Jesus said would identify the people who follow him? The word was love, that they will know me by your love. And so what 
Peter, first of all, is saying is, our calling is to love people. And sometimes, yes, there's such a thing as tough love, but that people should know the followers of Jesus by their love, by, in a way, doing good. Next verse. But even if you should suffer for what is right, and many Christians did, you are blessed. Don't fear the threats you receive. Don't be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. The Greek word for Lord, curious, has the meaning of master. Master or Lord of our life. See, before we even talk about how to disagree well verbally, we have to think about our mindset and our hearts. And the question that we need to ask ourselves, because this is the key, is who do you or what do you revere as Lord and master of your life? Is it you and your opinion and how I feel and what I think? Am I the master of my life and what I think? Or is it culture? Is it comfort? Is it popularity? Is it status? It starts with our mindset. What do we revere as the master or the Lord of our life? And if it's Christ, well, well then we go with what he says. And then he continues, verse 15. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. How do we disagree well? The first thing Peter says here is be prepared to give an answer. Now, I want to call out something that I think a lot of Christians tend to misunderstand. You see, in the Bible, Jesus compliments or commends childlike faith. Do you know what that means? It means that Jesus sees the trust of a child for his or her parents to be the epitome of what he wants for his people and how they trust their heavenly father just like a, a child trusts his good father. But do you know what Jesus doesn't commend? He commends childlike trust. He does not commend childlike ignorance. And there's a difference. And why I'm saying this is sometimes I think we as Christians think, you know what? I don't need to know much. I don't need to grow because all I need to do is be like a child. Just know that Jesus is my savior and that's enough. And that's enough for salvation. There's no doubt about it. But God never commends immaturity in faith but he wants us to grow in understanding and to wrestle with the questions that we have and then trust like a child, but to pursue like an adult. And so that's why series like we're in right now are good because they help us grow and to think and not only answer our own questions, but be ready to give an answer. That's the first way to disagree well. Be ready. Be ready to give an answer. Grow in your understanding. Be in the word often. And then Peter points out the thing that is most important to be ready with. He said, be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. What's the reason for the hope that you have? Are you ready to answer that question? I think most of us would be say, yes, Jesus is the reason. But many of us maybe have never really thought about how we would share that with somebody who didn't know about it. So I thought very quickly here, I want to show you a way that I tend to share with someone who knows very little about Jesus, about what he's done. And if online or in the house, if you'd like to write some things down and write this down, there's, I know, a bunch of white space on the page with the, um, the scripture lesson for today. So how do I give the answer or the reason for the hope that I have? Well, here's 
a way to do it. The story of the entire Bible is a story of us and God. And when God created the world, everything was perfect. God was perfect. The world was perfect. Except no arms. Now we're perfect. (laughs) We were perfect. But then sin happened. And when that happened, there was a chasm, a divide between us and God. And not only did sin happen in the world, but Paul writes in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you could talk to the person about ways that you have seen this to be true in your own life, the the things that we sometimes think or the ways that I haven't been a perfect husband or a, a perfect father and things. The Bible also says that because of sin, that we deserve death. Romans 6, 23. We need to be back in relationship with our Heavenly Father. The only way to do that, well, people try lots of things. And, and most of the things they try are trying to get there on their own, trying to, to jump this expanse to their perfect heavenly father on their own. You know, if I just do a bunch of good things, but what God requires is perfection. Well, you know what? I haven't killed anyone. Well, that, that's good. But it's not what God requires. I work hard at work. Well, it doesn't get you there. I'm kind to most people. Well, that doesn't get you there either. It's only perfection. So God decided as he looked down on us in love, Romans 6, 23, the second part, says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so what God did is he built a bridge. He built a bridge. We could not get there on our own, but God built a bridge. And do you know what that bridge was? That bridge was Jesus. And he completed that work for us on the cross as he, the perfect lamb of God, gave himself up for us. He did the work that we needed. He gave us his perfection. And by faith in the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts, we are able to have relationship with God once again. Be prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that you have. One last thing. Ends this way. (laughs) But do this with gentleness and respect. Ooh. That's the second part of disagreeing well, number four. Respond with gentleness and respect. That first word, gentleness, it means without anger, without yelling, without ranting. I think in certain translations, it actually says without Twitter. (laughs) Because that's what we as a culture have gotten ourselves into, is ranting and raving And I want to acknowledge, I understand why that happens. Because for many of us, man, there is nothing more important than these things. This is at the heart of who we are, the heart of our hope. There's going to be passion around this. I get that. But what Peter points out is that sometimes more important than what you say, and that's important, is also along with it how we say it. And then he says, oh, go back, with respect. That can be hard. In fact, I want you to picture in your mind, I know this is going to be a little hard for you, maybe in the moment you don't want to think about it, but someone you disagree with. (laughs) Maybe it's someone you don't even know. It's a politician. It's a group. I want you to think about that person, those people in your mind. And they vote differently than you. They think differently than you. They 
teach differently than you. And now I want you to realize this. Do you know that one of our greatest comforts is that Jesus loved me so much that he was willing to die on the cross. And I want you to think of this, that the people you're picturing in your mind, Jesus loved them just as much as you, that he was willing to die for them on the cross. And when we think of that, the only reaction we can have is one of respect in the sense that an awe or a reverence for people that Jesus died for and wants to be with him forever in heaven. And that's going to direct us in how we respond, in how we think. Here's the question we started with. Are Christians intolerant? Well, I, I guess it depends. If you mean by that, that there is truth that we will be willing to compromise well, then I guess, um, I guess we are intolerant in that sense because there is truth that we won't compromise. But if by that we're asking our Christians people who are jerks and are impatient and just, you know, share truth but don't give answers with gentleness and respect, well, then I would say absolutely not. We are not that. And the great news is that God wasn't that way with you either. Here's what Peter wrote in another letter. And I have to imagine he's thinking about his own life and how at one time he was far from God as he denied Jesus and felt this gap between him and the Lord. He said, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise of returning and bringing people to be with him as some understand slowness. We're still waiting for that, aren't we? Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Do you realize how patient God has been with me? Do you realize have you thought about how patient and gentle and kind God has been for you in our seasons of wandering, in our moments where what we said and what we did was in direct opposition to what he said? We have a God who has been so patient with us and a savior who gave up what he deserved rightfully so that you might have what you don't deserve eternally. And that, my friends, that's where our hearts need to be as we think about how to act and interact in a world that needs Jesus more than ever. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we first of all today just thank you for the work of salvation that you have done in our hearts and in our lives that through you, we have hope, sure hope for eternity, that your son is the rescue plan, the only one. And we thank you that you have brought us to faith in that and now ask you for courage to be able to share that with gentleness and with respect to those around us. Lord, the world needs your son more than ever. I just pray that we, as your lights, shine a big old spotlight on the cross. It's in his name, Jesus' name we pray, amen.